Up next on the bottom line, new legislation designed to keep ghost guns off our streets. These tools of destruction and despair and chaos, when put in the wrong hands, can lead to absolute tragedy. We'll introduce you to a young man who wrote about his late mother in hopes his words would inspire others. So one day we got the, we, we got the results back and then boom, we, we, we were in. And we'll take you to a special place in Potomac that's providing support for young county residents. It makes you feel like you never, it, the, all this like pain and all this depression just gone away like that. Council Vice President Gabe Albernaz has introduced a bill that would put tougher restrictions on undetectable ghost guns. Statistics show the number of these weapons that are being confiscated is growing at an alarming rate. The number of these do-it-yourself firearms being purchased here in Montgomery County has significantly increased over the past several years. Bill 421 that addresses the prevalence and issue of ghost guns. In our this community. week, Council Vice President Gabe Albernaz introduced a bill to keep these weapons off the street. As we know, the prevalence of firearms is at an absolutely alarming rate and gun violence continues to plague our communities across the country. In fact, there have been um, over five homicides here in Montgomery County just this last week alone. We know that these tools of destruction and despair and chaos, when put in the wrong hands, can lead to absolute tragedy. Ghost guns don't have serial numbers and you don't need a background check to obtain one of these weapons. They are often sold as a kit that can be purchased online. Council Vice President Albernaz says these untraceable weapons can have very serious consequences and are disproportionately getting into the hands of youth. Over 40 ghost guns were confiscated by our Montgomery County Police Department last year as compared to less than six the year before that. And so this issue is very much on the rise. The other important thing to note about these weapons is that they're made of plastic or fiberglass, and that makes them extraordinarily difficult to be detected by metal detectors, which of course is especially revel relevant right now, given the insurrection that happened on our Capitol and the known threats that have been made to state houses across the country. The bill provides clarification as to what constitutes a ghost gun and prohibits the use, possession or sale of these guns with respect to minors and within 100 yards of places of public assembly. Montgomery right. County Police right. Chief Marcus here. Jones says um, possession of these weapons has been growing steadily and this bill will help curb this trend. We arrested 55 adults um, that were in possession of these weapons um, or and or selling them. And we arrested three juveniles under the age of 18 um, that were in possession of these weapons. State Delegate Leslie Lopez will be introducing a similar measure in the General Assembly to complement Councilmember Albernaz's bill. My bill will require that manufacturers serialize any unfinished receivers, and it also requires a handgun qualifying license for the sale of an unfinished receiver. It's not every day that a 10-year-old becomes a published author. In this story, we meet Montgomery County Public School student Arjun Krishnan, who put pen to paper about someone near and dear to his heart. By all accounts, this looks like just a bunch of friends playing a little game of football. You'd never know one of these young men is already a published author. My mom made the best flan in the world. Arjun Krishnan is a fifth grader at Jones Lane Elementary School. Back in April, he entered the Barnes & Noble Children's Short Story Competition. Out of tens of thousands of entrants, Arjun's story, My Mom's Flan, was chosen to be a part of the 15-story book. Well, my dad told me about it, and then, and then, he, and then he asked if we could start a story about, about our mom, like my mom. And so, and, and that's how it started. So we have me and a top chef. But there's more to the story here. My mom's flan was written in honor of his mother, Anjali. And then this is my mom holding me when I was a baby. Who passed away suddenly when Arjun was just seven years old. 
He and his mother shared a special bond and a love of baking, and hanging on to those memories of his mom inspired him to put pen to paper. And tell me about the story that you wrote. Well, it was about my, my mom's flan and how she made it and how I made it for Thanksgiving. And so you remember your mom's flan? Yes, it was so good. So a couple of years after his mom passed, Arjun decided he wanted to make his mom's flan for Thanksgiving. And this is the flan recipe. Yes, this is the recipe. And this is her handwriting. Yes. He teamed up with his friend's mom, Chandra, who has stepped in and helped Arjun grow his baking skills. As the story tells it, the first run was a flop. We did everything, but this was a confusing part. It said evaporated milk plus one can of water and on top of it one can of milk. So then I, we just thought, me and Chandra, that we thought, why don't we add both just to see how it works to start. And then so when we did it, the flavor was correct. The consistency was a problem, too much liquid. But they finally were able to recreate his mom's flan just as he remembered it. The next time we decided to take out the water and, that, and then it worked. And then finally we did it one more time before Thanksgiving like probably on a, like a Tuesday and then we brought it to Thanksgiving, everyone loved it. In writing My Mom's Flan, Arjun was able to showcase his creativity so well that it caught the eye of the CEO of Barnes & Noble who wrote him a letter to congratulate him on his work and told him the story would be published. It's just like you're one in a thousand. Yeah. That's, really, that's really hard. And then they just, they just decided that it was really good and stories and then so one and so one day we got the we, we got the results back and then boom we, we, we were in this is a picture of when I met Anjali first oh Arjun's father Sabu says the support of the community following Anjali's death has meant the world to him and his boys all of my friends mothers would also encourage me and now Arjun's story is a way to show those around them the difference they have made in his life. Have this kind of a um, heartbreaking yet heartwarming tale mm -hmm. of family and friends being together and that's what's the most important thing. Um, I think that, that just resonates in this, not only on a personal space, but just on a community and a global level, um, what this, this story resonates. And we are very thankful to be able to express it. Councilmember Craig Rice chairs the Education Committee. Uh, it's really cool to be able to see uh, a young author uh, give you an autograph. Arjun sent him his own autographed copy of the book, which he says is a testament of resilience. Arjun, to you I say thank you. Thank you for setting an example. Thank you for showing how we can move past grief. Thank you for showing how we can live uh, the legacy of people in our community that we may have lost and make sure that it lasts forever. So I got this from Aunt Kelly and Aunt Lori, it's an, and they know how much I like the edge of brownies. So Arjun says he will keep his mom's memory alive by continuing to bake. Looking good, looking good. And he's even thinking of one day going to culinary school. But for now, he's enjoying being a 10-year-old boy who loves to play football. Oh, oh! And by giving the world his story of my mom's flan, he's hoping to make a difference. It just might help somebody else that doesn't have a mom who's like just lost her struggling dad or mom. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter, just struggling with that one parent and having to have help from other people. And, and this is how it like, like how you can regain that strength and like, and still be happy without that parent. I'm excited to continue baking many things just like my mom. Oh, yeah. very good, very, very good. Oh, that's hilarious. Meet Rami the goat. <laughs> Believe it or not, he's a therapist of sorts. He's an attention hog. Rami lives at Dreamcatcher Meadows in Potomac, where young people of all ages can come for therapeutic social, vocational, and recreational programs. Well, the idea of therapeutic recreation falls up under the category of what's called farming for health. She's a fainting goat. And this is a type of green care farming that we're doing here at Dreamcatcher Meadows, where it's not that you have to be necessarily a licensed uh, therapist to be able to work with youth in a therapeutic way. And it will expand the um, 
idea of therapeutic recreation into farming where they can actually also gain some skills and feel really good about themselves with meaning and purpose. Dreamcatcher Meadows is an inclusive green care farm and animal sanctuary on six acres in Potomac. The goal of this nonprofit is to bridge the gaps for young people with neurodevelopmental issues. The goal, to reduce stress and provide a safe recreational space to socialize and learn job skills. Come on in. Iris is a junior at Churchill High School. She's been coming to the farm for more than a year. When I come to the farm, it's basically me stepping into another world where I'm free to be myself because when I'm at school or any social places, I feel like I'm being watched and in a point where I'm uncomfortable. But when I'm here, I'm free to be myself. So I have this kind of peace within myself and happiness. And these animals are really soft. Iris helps with registration for events at the farm and also gives tours. Her mother, Kabali, says it's given her daughter confidence. Not even begin to say how much it has helped Daria. She had so much of anxiety and depression, and she has come a very, very long way. Council Vice President Gabe Albernaz chairs the Council's Health and Human Services Committee. Susan's set up an exemplary program because you have the natural environment and the animals and the connection with the animals and the work on various projects, which is therapeutic in its own right. But then in addition to that, you add the very intentional and wonderful curriculum that she has established that meets students where they are. And there are thousands of Montgomery County Public School students and Montgomery County students that would benefit from an experience like this. And so I think this is a unique opportunity to take advantage of an asset that's here, the passion and energy of a really terrific community leader, and leverage that to help a lot of kids. Dreamcatcher Meadows also offers programming to earn student service learning hours while learning about sustainable farming and caring for animals. The end goal? to provide these programs through MCPS and Montgomery College by showing this work is a valid way to engage youth in the community. We've designated a third of our county in an agriculture preserve. That offers a wealth of opportunity for youth in terms of recreation, social activities, and vocational training. However, right now, we don't have the capacity in our school system to engage students in that way. So this program would allow us to begin that process. This summer, Katie Rose started her journey at the farm. She's had a lot of problems socially in school. And her mother, Alicia, said she was apprehensive and shy. Her first thing when she got here to gently introduce her to the animals it was the babies. She was terrified. When she was holding the bottle, it was like she was shaking and she was stiff and everything. And it's, it's the second time she did it, she did it like a pro. So we, can, we can come in, use a tour. Today, she's engaged, self-assured, and speaks openly about how Dreamcatcher Meadows has changed her life. Here is the popular chicken, Mr. Fluffy. <laughs> At first, I was really scared, kind of like overwhelmed or nerve-wracked with, with, the, with the thought of like interacting with them. I have trouble with my anxiety. Whatever I'm into a social situation such as, oh, you're going in the crowd, trying to socialize with friends on a normal basis, it's just like it's difficult. It makes you feel like you never, it, the, all this like pain and all this depression just gone away like that with interacting with the in animals. As the county continues to navigate through the coronavirus pandemic, Councilmember Albernaz says yeah. programs like this will become even more valuable as we address the emotional toll of the crisis on our youth. I've lost a lot of sleep worrying about the social and emotional toll of the pandemic on our kids. Um, you know, with youth not being in a classroom for almost a year now, um, not only is there an academic impact, but I'm actually more worried about the emotional impact because they're not able to spend time with their friends. They're not able to engage with other caring adults. And so I think we need really active solutions, really dramatic solutions to help address the unique needs of our students because they have fallen so far behind on so many levels. 
it's solutions like this that we have to look for. For more information about Dreamcatcher Meadows, visit their website. Well, that does it for this edition of The Bottom Line. I'm Susan Kennedy. Thanks for watching.